Glimpses of religion. From my sixth or seventh year up to my sixteenth, I was at school, being taught all sorts of things except religion. I may say that I failed to get from the teachers what they could have given me without any effort on their part, and yet I kept up on picking up things here and there from my surroundings. The term religion I am using in its broadest sense, meaning thereby self-realization or knowledge of self. Being born in the Vaishnava faith, I had often to go to the Haveli, but it never appealed to me. I did not like its glitter and pomp. Also, I heard rumors of immorality being practiced there, and lost all interest in it. Hence, I could gain nothing from the Haveli. But what I failed to get there, I obtained from my nurse, an old servant of the family whose affection for me I still recall. I have said that. There was in my me a fear of ghosts and spirits. Ramba, for that was a name, suggested as a remedy for this fear, the repetition of Ram Nam. I had more faith in her than in her remedy, so at a tender age I began repeating Ram Nam to cure my fear of ghosts and spirits. This was of course short-lived, but the good seed sown in this childhood was not sown in vain. I think it is due to the seed sown by that good woman Ramba that today Ram Nam is an infallible remedy for me. Just about this time, a cousin of mine who was a devotee of the Ramayana arranged for my second brother and me to learn Ram Raksha. We got it by heart and made it a rule to recite it every morning after the bath. The practice was kept up as long as we were in Porbandar. As soon as we reached Rajkot, it was forgotten. For I had not much belief in it. I recited it with partly because of my pride in being able to recite Ram Rakshad with correct pronunciation. What, however, left a deep impression on me was the reading of the Ramayana before my father. During part of his illness, my father was in Porbandar. There were evening he used to listen to the Ramayana. The reader was a great devotee of Ram, Ladha Maharaj of Bileshwar. It was said of him that he cured himself of his leprosy not by adding medicine but applying to the affected patras bilva leaves which had been cast away after being offered to the image of Mahadev in Bileshwar temple and by the regular repetition of Ram Nam. His faith, it is was said, had made him whole. This may or may not be true. We at any rate believed the story. And it is a fact that when Latha Maharaj began his reading of the Ramayana, his body was entirely free from leprosy. He had a melodious voice. He would sing the dohas and the chopais, the couplets and the quatrains, and explain them losing himself in the discourse and carrying his listeners along with him. I must have been 13 at that time. But I quite remember being enraptured by his reading. That laid the foundation of my deep devotion to the Ramayana. Today I regard the Ramayana of Tulsidas as the greatest book in all devotional literature. A few months after this we came to Rajkot. There was no Ramayana reading there. The Bhagavat, however, used to be read on every Ekadashi day. Sometimes I attended the reading but the reciter was uninspiring. Today I see that the Bhagavat is a book which can evoke religious fervor. I have read it in Gujarati with intense interest. But when I heard portions of the original read by Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya during my 21 days fast, I wished I had heard it in childhood from such a devotee as he is, so that I could have formed a liking of it at an early age. Impressions formed at that age strike roots deep down into one's nature and it is my perpetual regret that I was not fortunate enough to hear more good books of this kind read during that period. In Rajkot, however, I got an early grounding in toleration for all the branches of Hinduism and sister religions. For my father and mother would visit the, visit the Haveli as only Shiva's and Ram's temples <coughs> and would take or send us youngsters there. Jain monks would also pay frequent visits to my father and would even go out of their way to accept food from us non-Jains. They would have talks with my father on subjects religious and mundane. He had, besides... Muslim and Parsi friends who would talk to them about their own faith and he would listen to them always with respect and often with interest. 
But his nurse, I often had a chance to be present at this. Being his nurse, I often had a chance to be present at these talks. These many things combined to inculcate in me a toleration for all faiths. Only Christianity was at that time an exception. I developed a sort of dislike for it. And for a reason, in those days, Christian missionaries used to stand in a corner near the high school and hold forth, pouring abuse on Hindus and their gods. I could not endure this. I must have stood there to hear them on once only, but that was enough to dissuade me from repeating the exper- experiment. About the same time, I heard of a well-known Hindu having been converted to Christianity. It was the talk of the town that where, when he was baptized, he had to eat beef and drink liquor, that he also had to change his clothes, and that thenceforth he began to go about in European costume, including the hat. These things got on my nerves. Surely, thought I, a religion that compelled one to eat beef, drink liquor and change one's own clothes did not deserve the name. I also heard that the new convert had already begun abusing the religion of his ancestors, their customs and their country. All these things created in me a dislike for Christianity. But the fact that I have learned to be tolerant to other religions did not mean that I had any living faith in God. I happened about this time to come across Manusmriti, which was amongst my father's collection. The story of the creation and similar things in it did not impress me very much, but on the contrary made me inclined somewhat towards atheism. There was a cousin of mine still alive for those for whose intellect I had great regard. To him I turned in with my doubts, but he could not resolve them. He sent me away with his answer, when you grow up you will be able to solve these doubts yourself. Now these questions ought not to be raised at your age. I was silenced but was not comforted. Chapters about diet and the like in Manusmriti seem to me on the to run contrary to daily practice. To my doubts as to this also, I got the same answer. With intellect more developed and with more reading, I shall understand it better, I said to myself. Manusmriti at any rate did not then teach me Ahinsa. I have told the story of my meat eating. Manusmriti seemed to support it. I also felt that it was quite moral to kill serpents, bugs and the like. I remember to have killed at that age bugs and such insects regarding it as a duty. But one thing took deep root in me, the conviction that morality is the basis of things and that truth is the substance of all morality. Truth became my sole objective. It began to grow in magnitude every day and my definition of it also has been in every widening. A Gujarati didactic Take stanza likewise gripped my ha- mind and heart. Its percept returned good for evil because my guiding principle became my guiding principle. Now it became such a passion with me that I began numerous experiments in it. Here are those for me wonderful lines. For a bowl of water give a goodly meal. For a kindly greeting bow thou down with zeal. For a simple penny pay thou back with gold. If thy life be rescued. Life not, do not withhold. Thus the words and actions of the wise regard. Every little service tenfold they reward, but the truly noble know all men is one and return with gladness good for evil done.